I'm here with Timothy from Raptor Engineering, and uh, you know the Talos 2 workstation, we're taking a look at that, and it's really exciting, free and open stuff, but I've got to say, I think engineering Raptors, that's got to be tricky, because uh, they're probably always knocking stuff off, getting into things, opening doors. Pretty, I saw Spielberg that can open doors, so engineering a Raptor has got to be a really tricky situation. Well, you've seen the uh, the videos probably where uh, they're training eagles to go attack drones. Just imagine that on a large scale, right? <laughs> you do you do almost. I mean, for like the kind of defense that you need against like supply chain attacks and firmware attacks and God knows what governments are putting in in terms of like. Uh, I mean, there's rumors that Intel's random number generators compromised somehow. We saw the elliptic curve debacle. I mean, the NIST was in on stuff probably. And uh, I think you probably do need a Raptor, like a guard Raptor. That's probably about the level of security that you need in order to uh, keep the insanity at bay. Yep, especially if it's cut through your network cable. That's the biggest <laughs> problem. The, uh, uh, well, they're probably listening in. It's like, oh, cut the feed. Yeah, right. the feed. <laughs> <laughs> we use Intel. <laughs> so the most exciting thing about the Talos 2 is that it's open but it's also very fast. It's based on IBM's Power9, which, I mean, IBM's not giving away processors, obviously, but the specification is open if you're willing to pay IBM enough money, which means that it can be audited, which is great. And the entire rest of everything else, Raptor Engineering is responsible for it. At least, that's my understanding. I mean, is that... Yeah, you yeah. guys have done everything soup to nuts, which is really an incredible feat of engineering to have a computer this open. I mean, if you're worried about... Well, really anything. You can change anything on the platform. You can even implement your own cryptographic signing of your firmware. And so only you have, you can take those keys offline. And then if you want to update your firmware, you have to have those keys or you could, you know, like do a reset. But you guys even have physical jumpers to prevent the flash memory in the firmware from being rewritten, which is awesome. Yeah, yeah. Our focus has been on security from, from day one. Um, owner controllability, we like to call it. That is to say that rather than having a corporation that's able to either remotely update or they're the only ones that can even issue updates to the platform, we give you literally full source code. It's all online. We give you a DVD with schematics. Um, for the, the whole concept is to put as much control as possible in your hands and to um, allow you to make as many modifications to the system as you can. One of the most surprising things to me actually using the system was that it's basically ready to go. So, I mean, I've used, uh, I've used um, the RISC-V development kit, and it's like, oh, RISC-V, it's open, and it's, it could be the future. Uh, but Power9 is here, at least in my opinion, and it's actually very fast. I mean, it's a very competent workstation. I mean, I was rocking 64 gigs of memory, eight cores, and eight times four threads. I mean, it was a pretty solid system. I was using the, the WX7100 graphics cards and several different NVMe flash drives, and it was a good experience. I was basically able to use everything that I wanted to use on Linux, and it was fine. That's great to hear. That's exactly what we're aiming for. Um, you know, and you're actually using a, a relatively low-end system. Um, these these boards um, are, we have a dual socket board that takes up to two 22-core chips. So you're looking at 176 threads. Um, you know, these this is this is big iron. This is uh, this is traditional IBM, but um, we're working real closely with them to, to make sure that we can bring that traditional big iron, high-end server stuff down into even the developer and even consumer space um, because we, you know, our philosophy is that um, these systems should not be restricted to security, uh, owner control. They shouldn't be restricted to the high end. Everyone should be able to have a computer like that. I've got a full video coming on like the performance and the benchmarks and that kind of thing, but it's really, um, it really today, it's like to connect with the people behind, or at least one of the people behind uh, the engineering that goes into something like I, it's, it's got to be daunting because. Uh, I mean, just like the bootstrap stuff, and then you've got to connect with, with IBM on the specification, and like the Open Power Foundation, I mean, what, what all goes into that? quite a lot of work. Um, I've got my fingers uh, as, as a manager in a lot of different pots here, um, but I'm, I'm also actually also a director um, on the Open Power board. Um, so, you know, we're, we're in there as a company um, saying, well, we need that we need the open systems and really um, striving to uh, to drive that part of the system forward. Um, but you know, as far as uh, firmware and everything, IBM has actually been pretty good. We've been, we have a we have a long standing relationship with IBM, and we've been able to really help um, get things released to the general public, not just to us. Um, we were the driving force behind. If you go to our wiki, you can actually see I think it's tens of thousands of pages of processor documentation. That was us getting that all freed up. Um, so you can literally go through. You can download source code. You look at the documentation. You know what you're changing. You know why you need to change it. 
you want to audit it, but you might, you know, basically go ahead, download all the documentation. They can have a field day. It'll take them months, you know, maybe even years <laughs> to audit, but, but you can in theory. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, that would be important. I could see that a lot of, uh, a lot of, you know, you know, foreign companies would probably want to look at this as like after things like Spectre and Meltdown and things like the other, you know, security issues that have happened over the last couple of years, having a vendor that is be willing to be that open, I can see that there's a lot of commercial value in that. Yeah, that, that's our thought. Um, it's actually uh, kind of surprising in that um, a lot of commercial vendors, um, how do I put it? I think they they think that they have more legal recourse than they do um, against, the, against the vendors. And um, it's been a, a relatively slow shift. Um, but slowly, we are seeing more and more people. It's, it's largely a lot of smaller players, um, but they're starting to come on board and realizing, hey, wait a minute, we're liable for this. Our company's reputation is on the line. Uh, whatever it is, we need to actually start looking beyond the Intel ecosystem. Um, the large players, there's a lot of inertia. Um, that being said, um, Google um, in particular is on record as um, actually having Power9 live in their data centers running production workloads. So you, you're starting to see some of the key players say, wait a minute, we need to at least be prepared to shift. And if anything else goes wrong, okay, that's, that's our warning shot. You know, we're, we're, we're prepared to switch. Yeah, I, I saw some really interesting stories from some Google engineers regarding uh, both corporate and foreign espionage and espionage attempts. And so it's easy to imagine things like the supply chain attack. But the features that you have in hardware would, if you're somebody like Google, you could really harden that hardware and make those attackers' jobs much, much more difficult, even if they have access to the supply chain. Only if you have actual control of the platform. See, even Google, to the best of our understanding, does not have control of the platform. Uh, as far as I understand, they use basically standard Intel. Yes, it's packaged up in, in their own custom mainboard and everything else, but even Google doesn't have access to the IME source code. They don't have the signing keys. They, they, they are just as much of Intel's mercy as everyone else. Yeah, yeah. I meant with on like the Power 9 side. Like they were seeing some of this stuff on their existing infrastructure, and as a result of that, it's like, hmm, Power 9, yes. Yes, and we've, and, got to, we've got to do this. And uh, you know, we've been involved since basically the the start of the Open Power um, Initiative, and that would be Power Eight. Now, Power Eight, um, we we did not have a competitive chip. I mean, it was basically it was power hungry. It, it was it was fast in certain areas, but at the same time, you can't in the in the standard data center, you can't get past the power consumption. So one of the things that we're really excited about Power Nine and going forward, you know, we we we're working with IBM even on Power Ten to some extent here in terms of just making sure that certain key metrics are hit. But Power9 um, is the first IBM chip in, in a very long time to actually compete directly with Intel and performance per watt. We're talking about something that's just as efficient energy-wise as an Intel or AMD chip. Um, and uh, with Spectre and Meltdown in there, um, Intel has been not enabling the mitigations for the most part. Um, you actually have to go turn on flags um, because it kills our performance so much. And what, what it really hurts is performance per watt. Um, and uh, so, so it's really one of these things where, if anything, Power 9 might actually be more efficient than an equivalent Intel processor at this point. I would believe it. I mean, based on my experience using the workstation, the only thing that was a bit weak was uh, uh, like SIMD type workloads, things like things that would be, I guess, an equivalent like the AVX type workloads could take advantage of. But got the workstation graphics. I mean, I've got a Tesla V100 that I did some testing with, and aside from some niggles with the proprietary binary firmware, I mean, even that worked, although I wouldn't really want to do that long-term. The WX7100 graphics card, though, was, was great. Yeah, and we're working, um, we've actually done some work as some people working on getting Rockem from AMD to actually work on these platforms. So, yeah, AMD's behind. Yeah, the graphics aren't great, but really, can you trust the output of that NVIDIA driver compute? I mean... I, I don't know the the Rock M improvements from like the 2.0 series like 2.1 I think I was using that yesterday or the day before it's seriously impressive performance these days especially on some of the more modern like the MI60 and the uh, uh, the Radeon 7 because they didn't they didn't gimp the floating point performance as much on Radeon 7 I was surprised yeah so if we get Rock M up on power and as far as I know we're really close. Um, at this point, you got a solid um, platform where the only binary firmware you have to deal with is inside the card itself. And you know that's a, that's the thing, kind of our philosophy behind the security model, is that uh, we're we're a little more pragmatic than um, the Free Software Foundation can be, things like that. And, and a couple a couple key differences I'll, I'll highlight. But our security model is based more on we understand the vendor, in some cases, feels they need to use proprietary firmware. 
keep that on the other side of the aisle of you. Don't trust the card with sensitive data. And you, at least if we got control of ring zero and below, in theory, it's a reasonable compromise. Obviously, we like to have open firmware for everything, but in reality, there's two GPU manufacturers, and one has uh, gone even worse than Intel. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've I've experienced that. One of the other key differences is that we don't accept ROM loaded um, binary anything as a uh, free respects your freedom type qualification if there's firmware we and it is updatable in any form that means even if you can desolder a chip and solder a new one in we require that to be open source on our base platforms um, and and a lot of the component choices you see on these boards is driven around that criteria that makes sense uh the uh what is it petite boot with the uh, ast 2500 uh the the ast 2500 of of it seems like it has been experiencing record adoption, let's say, in the uh, in the industry, which um, the open like the openness of something like that would have been unthinkable, I think, five or six years ago, because everybody was guarding their IPMI remote management stuff fiercely. And now it's like, ah, here's everything. Go to town. Right. That was IBM behind that. And it's really great to see um, it even before that. I mean. You heard of the super micro um, supply chain attacks, I'm sure. And uh, one of the first things, we have a technology called FlexFair that um, is designed to be a TPM as, we, as it should have been, if I had to call it, um, to actually allow the owner to secure their own machine to protect it against direct hardware attack, kind of make it so that um, physical access is not equal to root, right, as, as we kind of have to assume today. Um, but what's interesting about that is it's designed to sit in between the flash memory and the uh, BMC. And it's designed to sit there and intercept commands and make sure that the BMC comes up in a known state. It's also monitoring a ton of other signals on the board, making sure nothing's tampered with. But the reason I bring that up is because the first time we heard about the super micro attacks, the first thing we, we, we thought was, well, wait a minute. We, you, you could do an intercept. You could change U-boot parameters with a chip the size of a grain of rice if you wanted to, do using exactly the same technology we developed to secure the machine. So, so the fact that the simple fact is, when you're relying on proprietary BMC, you are open to every form of attack you can think of, including supply <laughs> yeah. chain, uh, because you have no way of knowing what's actually going on. We had a we had a Dell um, R710 laying around the office, and it was like, I wonder if this could work. We modified the uh, firmware of the uh, the iDRAC and made it so that you could never flash a not backdoored. Uh, IDRAC to the R710. So Dell was like, oh, we patched it. Uh, no, he didn't. <laughs> no, no, he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and the other thing is with the IDRAC, um, a lot of times that's, I think that's a proprietary or, yeah. Uh, yeah that, 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 what is that anyway? It's a, uh, I haven't seen one in ages, but it's not an A-suite. There's no data sheet. There's no documentation. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a black box. It's right. like, Trust us, it's fine. And it's like, it's not fine. It's no, not fine no, and looking at, you know, because we have access, obviously, to the data sheets um, for the, even the A speed, um, there are multiple registers open for debugging. And if you don't know about them, you can't close them. So, and, and <laughs> no data sheet, you don't know about them. Yeah. Yeah. So, what, what, you know, you've been in the trenches, obviously, for a long time. And this, this kind of technical work, I mean, I do some of this kind of tech, not, not your, not your hardware engineering, but I get to work in a technical field sometimes. And I've got some war stories that I probably will never be able to do a video on, but it's like, man, I really wish I could tell somebody about the time blank. So here's your chance. If you've got a story where it's like, man, I just, and it was like, oh, we, we, we debugged it all the way down. And it turns out, you know, what, if you, if you've got a story like that, you want to share, here's your chance. Well, you know, actually, I'll just say during, I think we can share this, during the Talos 2 bring up, um, we actually, uh, we, we had to do a lot of um, firmware ratification. The, uh, you know, at the time, we're talking late 2017, was it? Something like that. Does that sound right? It's it, it, it been in this for so long, I, I kind of get the years mixed up every now and again. But um, when doing the initial bring up, the, the open VMC was not in a, in a very good state. Um, we had to do a lot of work to try to bring it up to the quality level you're seeing now. Um, at that time. And uh, one of the interesting things we hit was that um, every one in a hundred boots um, on the dual processor system, we would see the FSI bus hang, just, just lock up completely. Um, and, uh, you know, for a little bit of background, the BMC talks to CPU zero over FSI. CPU zero relays uh, the FSI information to CPU one. And what we're seeing is that the interface between the two chips would just freeze. Uh, no information 
that you know transfer possible whatsoever and this was all kinds of fun to try to debug um, but what it comes down to is that we found out that if you're trying to bring cpu one online at the same time you're trying to send um, sensor read commands over fsi to cpu one or zero that an internal piece of silicon deep within the cpu will the state machine will hang and uh, you'll require <laughs> power reset. And even IBM didn't know this at the time. You know, we, we kind of discovered the bug. Um, so, so when you see um, in our firmware all kinds of things about an IPL observer, um, you know, things like that, is because over a long period of time we figured out that okay, we had to shut down our fan controls until we got both CPUs online. Then we can start reading sensors and re-engage the fan controls. So you. you <laughs> <laughs> How did this happen? <laughs> right, right. And, 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 you know, it's always fun when you're doing something that's one in 100 or one in 200. I mean, systems even went out to the customer because we didn't even see it happening at first. We thought we'd worked around it enough. But no, you have to actually keep everything offline until until ski boots actually up and running um, you know so this is one of these one of these fun things I mean it you know and to be fair it happens this is this is very normal um, the difference is that here you can look in our git commit history and you can see oh wait a minute you actually have to do X y and Z right uh, with an enter apply this, this, this opaque I mean, binary that we have no idea what else it does but it's supposed to fix something <laughs> 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 well, it would it would be impossible to troubleshoot that. I mean, you would just live with those kind of quirks. And interestingly, I do see a lot of those kind of quirks tr tr uh, sort of creeping into enterprise machines. I mean, there are systems that I've worked on that have been quarter of a million dollars, half a million dollars, and you know, literally after a week of troubleshooting with the vendor, it's like, mm, let's do things in this sequence of events and just work around that problem. And it's like, okay, sounds good. I mean, it's it's less of a problem on commodity machines, I guess, because the impetus is you have to fix it. But, you know, for those half a million dollar machines, it's like, how many customers are there really worldwide? Is it really worth fixing it? And most of the time they don't. And like, maybe they'll fix it in a next generation product, but that you can actually do that with this platform is really a testament to uh, how much is going to be involved in the future, I think, because the complexity of other systems has to slow its progress. I mean, it's just too complicated. Getting, I mean, that's it's really the origin of Meltdown and Spectre. I mean, Meltdown more so than Spectre is that things have just gotten to the point where it's so complicated. No one's running validation on these things. Um, you know, with Intel especially, they're not running validation on their firmware. It's a minimal does it boot. Um, because they know they can throw the responsibility yeah. over the walls of the OEMs. Oh, talking about your OEM for a fix, you know, not our problem, <laughs> right? But uh, <laughs> but here here we're at the point where yeah. Yeah, yeah we as an OEM, you know, Raptor Computing Systems as an OEM is going to try to send out firmware updates, but at the same time we're not going to throw a half half done one over the wall. We're going to make sure it's actually working because um, at this point we have a we have a long collection of corner cases and things that have to have to pass. Are you excited for the future of with like? Is Power 10, where is that? Is that around the corner? I, I don't I'm know. not really authorized to comment too much on that, but um, <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's just say that uh, it's on schedule, uh, looking great, um, and that uh, I think that uh, some of the concerns that you've seen um, working with Power 9 are definitely being addressed. Um, you know, it's, it's stuff that we brought up uh, months and months ago before, and everyone's working it. Well, I just, I mean, I want to be clear. Definitely go check out the benchmarks, but in terms of like, I need a computer to get my stuff done that is fast and responsive and can keep up with like an even insanely fast PCIe storage. I mean, even even things like this this HHHL. I mean, this thing is insane. This thing can do seven point five gigabytes per second and about a million IOPS. No problem keeping up with that. Even you know, I've got two four core CPUs. I think I probably I like it so much. I'm probably going to pick up the Blackbird with the eight core. Just because I think it's going to be a, an historical computer. It's like people look back and it's like, oh, I've got the Atari 8800. And it's like, this is, you know, the Blackbird is, I mean, I think it's it's on the same level. That's great to hear. And, uh, you know, it's interesting you mentioned the speed of that card. You're at about a quarter of the actual link capacity. <laughs> yeah. yeah, PCI Express 4.0. We don't, we don't even right. have that yet. Like, I can't, you can't, uh, what, what peripherals exist outside the enterprise world that are PCI Express 4.0? <laughs> Well, let's see. Broadcom's putting out a uh, 200 gig card, and it, it's, it's squarely enterprise, right? But I mean, you know, <laughs> we'll look at it in five years. It's going to come down to, to at least somewhat out of the data center. Um, yeah, yeah, at, at least to, to setups like yours, where, where you're you're maybe testing less high end, but at the same time, you know, looking for something that's not typical consumer either. Hey, listen, 100, 100 gig Ethernet can't come to my office fast enough. We're 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 slumming it right now with just 40 gigs. So I mean, you know. 
Yeah, there you go. I mean, that's 200 gig duplex, and, and we're talking per slot. These these chips are, I mean, IBM really, uh, they, they have an emphasis in I.O. capability. And one of the things you're going to see on these platforms is that uh, if you ever use an x86 box and you try to load it near 100%, you'll notice that it starts to, to kind of stall and stutter and just kind of misbehave, right? Yeah. Um, power doesn't do that. Um, there is enough bandwidth in the internal buses and to the peripherals where it literally, you can load it down. We have boxes we load down to 99.9% load, um, and uh, they're, they're still responsive. You know, this is where, where IBM really knows what they're doing. Now, uh, the Power 9, or the Power architecture, I guess, and Power 9, uh, supports an interface even faster than PCI Express, I thought. I'm not really clear on the details of that, though. Yes. Uh, you're thinking of OpenCAPI. There's actually two yeah. of them. One is, one is NVLink, which is NVIDIA's proprietary interface. You know, we're probably not all that interested in that here. But well, the other is OpenCAPI, and that's yeah. actually um, essentially a replacement. You could look at it as a replacement for PCIe, any generation. Um, we're looking at something that's much closer in um, concept to AMD's old hypertransport. They used to allow third-party um, uh, vendors to plug in hypertransport. Oh, we're, yeah. looking a, we're looking at a coherent bus, and we're looking at something that is that is essentially designed to allow you to insert a CPU of your own, essentially a CPU, a common accelerators. But we're looking really at something that's closer to a CPU of your own design into that slot, have it on the coherent bus, have the, the latency super low and the speed super high. Yeah, I was surprised at some of the shortcomings of PCI Express. I was looking into that for why uh, the risk five people didn't really adopt PCI Express at the core. And it's like, oh, this actually makes a lot of sense for something like OpenCAPI on the power side as well, because a lot of the problems of PCI Express go away with those more modern interfaces. Yep, and uh, what you're gonna see now is a, a kind of splitting in the industry. I think Intel's trying to create their own incompatible <laughs> competitor and so on and so forth. But um, We just learned about that a couple days ago. <laughs> yeah, the, the key being here is OpenCAPI. Um, any vendor that wants to actually implement a peripheral, they can get the specs, they can do it. We're actually, you know, I'll give you a little sneak preview. We're actually looking at you know, creating an open CAPI system of our own. Um, so, so we're looking at trying to kind of jumpstart development even there because um, accelerators are too important, especially with Moore's Law basically dying. Accelerators are too important to get locked behind another proprietary wall. Yeah. Well, you know, you hit a wall with the processor silicon, but if you have something like open CAPI, then it's easy to imagine a future where you've got a lot of really like bleeding edge custom silicon for like AI or machine learning or image processing. And then all of a sudden bandwidth is not much of an issue because you don't have to, there's so much bandwidth, you don't even have to worry about compression or anything like that. And it can be super low latency because it's just, you know, the raw data from a CMOS sensor that's a, a kajillion megapixels going into, you know, some kind of a neural net ends up. And then, the, you know, the power or whatever can do the processing that's suitable for general purpose computing, but the custom silicon is literally doing it in hardware. So it's right. the best of both worlds. And, you know, way back when, I mean, we're talking well over a decade now, we actually did some work in machine vision with FPGAs. Um, and, uh, you know, it's kind of a, what, 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 uh, what, what's old is new again to a certain extent. But, um, you know, that was back in the days when you could plug in the hybrid transport when you actually had these capabilities. Intel and AMD shut all that down. Yeah. It's interesting. Interesting. It's a, it's an interesting world that we live in, where these these kinds of things are the future of computing, but also these kinds of needs are something that I mean, you know, Richard Stallman's not wrong. It's just that it's hard to get there. It's very hard to get there because it, 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 each vendor thinks that they have something super secret that they you know can kind of hold on to and profit from, right? Right. And, and what we're really seeing is that, if anything, there's more value in actually having control of the machine and saying, hey, wait a minute, I got these machines. I think we can do X. We don't have to go and wave a uh, eight-figure paycheck in front of Intel to allow our, our, uh, our use case. We can actually go ahead and innovate. We can, uh, you know, even the Silicon Valley startups, right, they, if they have an idea, they can go ahead and implement it. They can do it on real hardware, and uh, they can do it a fraction of the time and cost that you'd have to on an equivalent x86 box. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it definitely seems like there's a, there are a lot of upsides. Um, is there anything else that you can think of that you want to share with the, the level one audience or, or anything in the adventures of engineering Raptors into... Uh... <laughs> Well, I would say that um, you know one of the one of the things that we run into a lot is that uh, people don't understand that this is here today that they actually switch their entire workflow today. I mean, if you're not using proprietary software, and a lot of you, 
um, probably your proprietary, proprietary software is either in the cloud or it's moving to the cloud. You know, we're seeing a lot of that. People are worried about copying. They shove it in the cloud. They don't have to worry about that. They get a license fee annually, all that, all that fun stuff, right? So the chances of you actually using proprietary software in your local workstation going forward keeps getting less and less. Um, and in that situation, if you're not using proprietary software in general, you can switch today. Um, it's, it's really easy. It's not, like, it's not like the old ARM world where you have to co compile a kernel and custom compile packages and everything else. We're talking about like 90 something, almost 99%, I think, archive coverage on Debian, you know, Linux, just for, uh, for packages, you APT get install, right? Fedora, uh, OpenSUSE, I mean, everyone's kind of getting on the PPC64 EL train here. Um, we're even working with the, the FreeBSD folks to, uh, there's, a, I believe at this point now, a bootable ISO uh, of FreeBSD for these new systems. So, you know, it's, a, it's a, go ahead and you're not locked to Intel. You, you see that latest security disclosure, you don't like it, come get a Blackbird, come get a, you know, uh, <laughs> switch right now. <laughs> it, it is an exciting future. It really is because uh, the incumbents have made some mistakes and there maybe is turtles all the way down in terms of those mistakes. Like you get all the way to the, I mean, I'm really worrying about the RNG. Like who would even, but it happened. An R, who would design an RNG that you blow a fuse to go into insecure mode? Yeah. I mean, that, 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 and this is where we, we run into um, Intel. Intel historically does this sort of thing. They're, they're, um, they're overconfident. Um, they're very, very confident in their own low-level security, but everyone finds that it's actually full of holes. Um, <laughs> so, you know, the open source world isn't immune. You know, I'll, I'll freely admit that. But the simple fact is having a million eyes on the source versus having maybe 10 eyes, you know, or something in some department that is so siloed they only see part of it. Um, you're going to get a worse security solution. Yes, it's going to be obscure, but as soon as someone cracks that open, it's open everywhere. Yeah, well, I think I think we've seen a couple examples of things that have been in, in the open, like the NIST, you know, dual elliptic curve encryption standard, but that still managed to incorporate weaknesses that were exploitable and not discovered for like 10 years. But boy, when they were discovered, it was hairy carry. Right. I think we're, we're in a different world now because there have been so many things like that. I don't think it. I don't think it's realistic that we would. At least I wouldn't advocate that an engineer or even like a super gifted person, like a Linus Torvalds type person, could go through and audit it. But you know, no. the oil and gas pipeline people of the world and like the you know the the uh, the major engineering companies have the resources to fully audit the platform stem to stern with like a Q-tip and a toothbrush. And that's not something that you can do really on, on any other platform that's viable today. And so I think that's a huge accomplishment. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, again, I like to hit the owner control bit. Um, one of the things that a smaller firm can do, they, okay, they can't audit the entire code base, but they can say, I don't like this attack service. I'm going to shut down network to the BMC. I'm going to turn off these things in the low-level firmware I don't like. I'm going to, you know, use a minimal hypervisor and so on and so forth. They have the right to do that. On AMD and Intel platforms, uh, even ARM, you don't have that right. You take the yeah. firmware as is or you don't use the platform. You got the platform security processor on competing platforms, and you're stuck, or the Intel management engine, or or whatever, and that it's there. You it's know, signed. It can't be removed. It can't be modified, except by Intel or any or AMD or anyone who's got their keys. And that's that. That last bit is what people forget. And the <laughs> Asus, the Asus supply chain attack, I think, really is starting to drive that home. That um, those keys, once they're out, they're out, and a lot of damage can be done. You you know, if your company has high value information, um, you know, even Apple, right? Um, how, how much value is there really? But, you know, how much value was there on knowing what the next Apple prototype would actually be? You know, oh, yeah. you're talking millions of dollars worth. Uh, maybe an attacker is all of a sudden motivated to get the keys. It's possible. It's a, Anything's possible in, in this in this world. But for right. the, uh, the secure computing stuff, there's Raptor Engineering. So it works out really well. Yep, we're okay. here. We're here now. It's actually Raptor Computing Systems. But, uh, yeah. So, so well, you know, a little bit of history there. Right? I'm sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, oh, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Raptor Engineering um, was actually around first. Um, we did a lot of work before the lockdown of the silicon. We did work with Core Boot and things like that, kind of doing the same type of solutions. Um, after AMT, AMD and Intel locked down and we started going to open power, we actually spun up a, re a sister company, Raptor Computing Systems, that uh, handles all the manufacture and everything. We do the design work, and they go ahead and, and bring it market. 
Okay, cool. So Raptor, if you were a Fortune 500, you might hire Raptor Engineering. But you as an individual, if you want a Talos 2 workstation or a Blackbird, you can go buy it today at Raptor Computing. Exactly. We, uh, we have a, a chassis um, that uh, we're, we're looking to put this in, a slimline chassis, you know, you're familiar with. Um, we actually have on Twitter um, a picture of it running Myth TV. Um, so, you know, it, it might be a little expensive right now for home theater, but, um, you know, kind of the whole idea is that we're in that space. The hardware is in that space at this point. Um, so if you're looking for something desk side that you don't need a large Talos unit for, um, you know, go ahead, and, uh, go ahead and pick up Blackbird. Yeah, I mean, the Blackbird with... Uh the eight core CPU, I think would make a perfectly reasonable, you know, home machine. I would feel a lot more confident about kids like right now, you know, Bitcoin and some of my banking stuff and things like that is just on a completely separate computer that I literally just turn off, uh, when it's, um, time to turn it off. And it's got an, it's got a built in Nick, but I actually use an add in Nick, um, because the add in Nick physically does not have power when it's off. Right. So well, is that true? It depends on the Nick. Yeah. And it, it depends, depends on, on the, the main board. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I, I know our, let's see, I think ours actually cuts power, yes, uh, but uh, but a lot of the Intel ones will keep a standby power to the, to the slot. Yeah, it depends, it depends on the NIC and, and, and some <laughs> things, but yeah, it is, it is possible to buy a NIC that turns off when the computer's off <laughs> and doesn't lie to you with its link lights or anything, so. It's, yeah. Right, and that's the thing is, you know, we, we put up with this for far too long, you know. Yeah. Uh, this is our this yeah. is our step toward toward uh, computing independence. Well, I, you know, when you dig into some of that, it's like there's a whole layer of uh, you know a whole layer of functionality that is built specifically to handle add-in cards that do have power and can actually wake the system mm -hmm. from the power off state or wake it from sleep or whatever. At uh, you know, and it's just it's literally just the management engine talking to the NIC, and the management engine can run on the NIC sometimes. Right. Um, Intel actually on, really on recent, yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, I mean, this is just one of those. Why why go through all these mitigation procedures when you can actually have a machine that you can you can trust? And, and it's not one of these static things. You don't just sit in a corner by default and assume that it's going to stay secure. But the point is, with the with the owner controllability, you can update it. You can you can make decisions. You can read the news, see what the current attacks are, and harden it. Yeah. Well, you can use the the access that you have to hardware to audit things that are that are going on otherwise. I mean, one of my favorite papers in the world was uh, was Richie's uh, reflections on trusting trust, where yes. he talks about the the compiler backdoor, and it's like, well, I mean, we're you could do that with literally anything, the whole the whole stack top to bottom. But because you guys have more access, you have a much better shot at detecting something like that because you can access the system sort of outside the system. Yes, and even, you know, an interesting thing that I think is overlooked, I mean, on one hand, we're looking to do reproducible builds and things, so you can do multiple compilers and try to get rid of the trusting trust, but at the same time, you know, you know what happened to the banana um, back when you had to, basically, they're all clones, right? So one virus wipes out the whole population. We have that right now with Intel. Um, what's interesting about owner-controlled boxes like this is as soon as you modify an aspect of that firmware, say for your company, you're not a clone anymore. That exploit isn't guaranteed to work. Yeah, <laughs> that that uh that uh that type of an environment I think is going to be important for the world moving forward because otherwise one rogue actor is going to have something that takes out you know think about somebody that finds a you know fundamental flaw in IPv6 and then all IPv6 devices will, are uh, vulnerable because the implementation is everybody following the spec exactly to the letter and it's like it doesn't matter what platform you're on because the spec was vulnerable. That's what happened with the elliptic curve thing. Right, it's happened to Wi-Fi. Uh, Wi-Fi was hit, um, and you know, and and now that we're dealing with a world where you got IoT stuff everywhere, um, that <laughs> God help I mean, us all. Pe pe people don't even know how to get up and turn on a light. I mean, this is just scary. But yeah. at the same time, the havoc that that could wreak. I mean, at <laughs> some always... point it becomes national security interest, right? You know, you need to make sure you have machines that 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 aren't going to get turned off at the at a single virus. <laughs> We at level one, the recurring joke is uh, we've got a baby monitor in Kiev that's DDoSing a heating system in Seattle or mining Bitcoin or something. It's like this is the IoT future that we live in. Yeah, it's <laughs> crazy. A rise of the machines. Well, I don't think it was ever. Uh, well, maybe some of the dystopian authors kind of went here. But, uh, I don't. Re I don't really remember anything like this. This level of ridiculous. It wouldn't have. It wouldn't have been accepted. It would have. Been, it was strained credulity. 
<laughs> we go back 10 years ago and it's like, yeah, we've got to really lock down these light bulbs because somebody might get in there and start mining Bitcoin and they just look at you like, what kind of future I, is this? You know, it's, it's uh, actually, it's like the, um, what is it? Is it Red? No, it's not Red Dwarf. There's another, there's another parody sci-fi, right? You know, where, where it's, it's so insane that you have talking bombs. Who needs, who needs an intelligent talking bomb? But, you know, there, there it is, right, for ordinance. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and back then, it was considered ludicrous and, and put in the sci-fi work. And now we have intelligent light bulbs. Yeah, yeah. It's a scary future. <laughs> well, this, this interview has been awesome. I've taken yeah. too much of your time. Oh, that's but, fine. But uh, I, uh, I think that there will be a lot of audi- interest from our audience on, on this kind of thing. And so I could see us doing something like this in the future. If you guys have anything in mind that you want to reach out, because ultimately, like, the video thing is just storytelling. So mm-hmm. having good, fun engineering stories or, like, we overcame this challenge or anything like that that you guys can think of that you want to do in the future, I'm on board to do it. So yeah, that's great. Don't have I mean, to once we get out. Once we get Blackbird um, GA, which, you know, we're looking at soon, um, it's actually at the manufacturer now. Um, but, um, you know, once that's GA, I think we could probably do something, too, get you a, get you a Blackbird unit or something. Okay, awesome. Yeah, that would be great. I mean, I will probably just buy one because, I mean, I really do think that it's going to be uh, one of those computers that's like, this is the first in, you know, this is the this is the computer that led to, it's like the, you know, the 8086 led to all of this or the Atari 8800 was like a different way of things that, and then ultimately like the video toaster and it's like there's a whole branch of computers that's just the thing. And I think the, 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 the Talos 2 is it for sure, but... The Blackbird is more. It's the mass market version. Yeah, I mean the other. We've actually got uh, serial number one. I think it is. (laughs) I mean, you know, the Talos too, right? It's it's hacked to pieces. It was one of the first ones that 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 uh, we had to do our bring up on, but uh, we still got it. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. Nice. (laughs) But uh, yeah, um, and I would say you know watch. I can't say anything of anything else, but watch in the next couple of months for something interesting. Okay. Um, you know, about open power. So, Awesome. That would be great. And uh, I really appreciate it. And I will uh, stay in touch by email. Just email me every now yeah, and then. Sure. It's like, hey, this is a thing we get going on. And I'll try to do the same. So if, I yeah, appreciate you, it. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.